So, okay, so Michael is with us. So whenever you're ready, Michael, we do have a question, and then we have a, an email with just a comment. So welcome, Michael. Let's go for it. Okay, well, first the comment is from Colleen, and she says, <coughs> excuse me, um, good morning. I hope that you and Michael are enjoying your time with your kids and grandkids. I don't have a question today. I just want to extend my sincere gratitude to Bob from Australia from helping me to reframe my vision when I see and hear what seems to be bizarre occurrences in our current political landscape. Observation of the beast squirming and shouting before the end of madness. Um, that truly raised my perception to the most loving way to observe the behavior of those whose tasks to serve the public that have been leaving me very confused lately. Also, the observation of the brightest light purposely being on the darkest shore. I truly appreciate the words and bring to my being this morning. I am sure going forward. Thank you, Bob, so much for this contribution. I am sure I am not the only one that's listening who felt your light. I appreciate you. And as always, I am grateful to Eugenie and Michael for bringing these wonderful moments into my life with your generosity in hosting this beautiful show. Blessings and have a wonderful day. Sweet. Awesome comments. And I'm with you, yeah. uh, Colleen. And I have one piece of feedback. You remember our definition of denial. Whenever I think as though something outside of me is the cause of what's moving inside of me, then I'm in denial. And when I go into denial, I have to dissociate from the very content of my own mind that's creating that state. So when you said you were confused over what's happening in the world, the be, you know, that whole, that whole thing, my offering would be, no, there's no confusion about what's happening in the world at all. There's just confusion in your mind. When we say that something in the world is the cause of our confusion, then we disown and disempower ourselves in being able to heal that confusion. So my invitation there would be, you know, dig out a worksheet, and, you know, the, the subject would be confusion. And your, your belief is going on in the world, and as you clean that up, with the first century Aramaic forgiveness process, then what you'll do is you'll be able to confront the very root of your confusion and free yourself from it. Then all of those things that your mind tells you you're confused about could happen 10,000 times more and you'd look at it and go, oh, there would be no confusion because you cleaned up the capacity for confusion. Otherwise, you know, confusion is just a structure in the mind. And if I keep thinking I'm confused about what they said, I'm confused about this, I'm confused about, no, no. I'm not confused about anything. I'm just, there's confusion in there. And that means conflicting thoughts. And when I clean up the dissociated part of my conflicted mind, then boom, end of confusion. There's clarity on everything. Just, you know, pretty straightforward. So, so great acknowledgement uh, for Bob and, uh, Joining you in that, thank you, Bob, and extending love in your direction. And also appreciation for the work you're doing in the arena of uh, working with people who have a tendency toward wanting to end their lives. So joining you in healing that dynamic in the world for sure. And there are my thoughts on that. And then you've got another qu a question, Jeannie? Yes. And this is from Michael Katie. Flip over to my email. Um, question for the show. Please expound more on, quote, unquote, the Sabbath. Um, so many in churches today insist on certain days. Some say Friday, some say Saturday, and the majority of the Western world says Sunday. What does the Aramaic present on this? What did Yeshua say? Well, that's a big question, Michael. There have been people arguing on that one for <laughs> for a long, long time. And, you know, one of, the, one of the first thoughts that came to mind when Jeannie shared that you'd asked that question was the scripture quote that says, to the creator, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. So 
So if we're going to pick what we call a day, is it going to be Saturday? Is it going to be Sunday? Is it going to be Tuesday? Is it going to be Thursday? Well, you know, which thousand years are you going to choose? Is it about what what our minds conceive of as a literal 24-hour day? You know, people are caught in this literalism of the of the seven days of creation, and they have to be 24-hour days because how else could it be? Well, that's just plain silliness in the context of the very text that's used to try to prove that someone's literal interpretation must be true. The Aramaic language is not a language that can be interpreted literally. There are so many metaphors, there are so many idioms in the language that you've got to stand in and as a space of active love and experience the energy behind the words in order to get an experience of what they mean. In other words, you got to be out of your mind, as we talked about yesterday. It's, it's a matter of freeing ourselves from perception. And the perceptual mind is always trying to say, well, I want to figure this out. I want to understand this. I want to. Well, here would be my input. If you listen to the story, now, were the seven days of creation, if you listen to, and we talked about this last week, I think, if you listen to Moses' story, he, te- he speaks about two totally different creations. He speaks about male and female who created them in the image and likeness of the creator. He created them. Boom, it's over. No mention of Adam, no mention of earth. No, the, the human is created. And then it speaks of the, the – it says there was no man to till the soil. Now, if – those seven days of creation where Adamos, now we're talking about the red clay, now we're talking about the physical universe, was the creator's day a thousand years in one of those days? Is evolution absolutely perfectly consistent with creation? Totally and completely when you have the brain cells for it. Maybe a day in the creator's creation process when it speaks of seven days, maybe it was 10 billion years. I don't know. But I can certainly, and is is creation compatible with evolution? Absolutely. I mean, if you can, if you can look at a, a, a fetus developing in the womb and it goes through a stage where it's got a tail and it's got nipples like a pig and, you know, I mean, if you can look at that and pretend there's no evolution, you gotta you got to be really, you know, fried in terms of understanding. So there is the creation of the human being described. And then there's the evolution of the human form, Adamos. This is where there was no man to till the soil, and then it brings in Nafsha, which is the created human essence, that is then breathed into Adamos and Nafsha, the spiritual essence, the created being, became an incarnated or a living spiritual being. How long did that take? I don't know how many, perhaps millions, billions of years, perhaps. I don't know. Does it matter? No. The key point, to that, if you read that passage about what happened after the creation, it says, and the creator rested. In other words, there was time, and, and you know, this was, it's interesting, that was part, this was part of our topic yesterday from the, um, the book of Thomas, is taking time apart from your own mind taking time apart from external activities, standing in the space of an, the active presence of love as a human being and experiencing your life from that perspective. And if you don't do that, you won't have a human life. You will be destroyed. So is a day of rest a necessity? Absolutely. Absolutely. And just like the way a child learns, you know, in the early days, um, you know, most of my kids' schooling was homeschooling, but we did spend some time with them in Montessori. And Montessori had an interesting system. Instead of every child at four has to be able to do this and every child at six has to do that, and every, every child is treated as an individual. And the the, the setting in a Montessori school is one where there are different environments and the job of the teacher is not to stuff information into the child's mind. In fact, if you think about 
education and stuffing things into the child's mind, then you really have to start to question this thing that says do not be conformed to the world because stuffing information into a child's mind is conform, being conformed to the world. Rather than being conformed to the world, to educate, educare means to draw out, to draw out the being that's in there rather than fill this multi-generational database called a body-mind unit with information that the child will then be trapped in. Thinking comes from being. So my take is that each of us need to take time out of our lives and I don't know, is that day going to be, I mean, do you decide tomorrow, if tomorrow is your day of rest, is it going to be 200 years, 500 years, 1,000 years you're going to rest? Because that's what Scripture says a day is to the Creator. Or is it going to be a strict 24 hours and it's got to be this Saturday or that Sunday or this Tuesday or that Wednesday? My offering would be, and, and men have gotten into their dogma fights over, it has to be this. And what are we up to uh, a few years ago, it was 37,000 different so-called or, or sects of so-called Christianity. I just saw somebody quoting the other day, and maybe the numbers have been updated, 37,000. So we've got somebody arguing for this dogma and that doctrine and that doctrine and this one and this one and this one. And rarely do you find someone who has any comprehension of what Yeshua said was the first law to being a human being. And that was that you had to have this space in the frontal lobes of your brain called Rakba active so that you had your human life in your human form and take time every day, take time every week, take time every month, take time every year to be at rest from the, your attention on the world and be still. Gee, what are we going to know if we be still? Be still and know. What's the Creator say? Get quiet. Just, you know, shut your mouth and, and listen. Be still. And then we get to have a direct experience of our relationship with the Creator. What Yeshua laid out was, in my estimation, in the study I've done over the last 50 years plus, is the finest, most effective method for achieving the objective of a spiritual life, and that is to incarnate as a human being and to function as love, whatever's going on in the world. If our awareness, if our information has come from the mind of men, we're liable to get trapped in people who, in the name of a text that says, as I said yesterday, over 300 times says, fear not. You might get trapped in the, in the mind of a person who says, the fear of God, fear of love is the beginning of wisdom, which, you know, I mean, that's pretty silly, but that's the basic tenet of a lot of teachings that are supposedly following this man, Yeshua. So... I wouldn't move in the direction of answering, is it Saturday, is it Sunday, is it Tuesday, is it Thursday? My take would be take time to be in that space where you're connected. And, you know, if you, if you listen to the commandment part of it, the final words in that are, and keep it holy. Now, does that mean that you have to be down on your hands and knees and holiness? No, no. Keep it holy. Be, be in the space where you are able to attune to the life that you were given and you live out of that life and bring that wholeness, bring that state of being into your experience in the world. Now you've got wholeness. So that would be my take. I hope that makes some sense. And uh, if there are any other thoughts, if, if you're on the line, Michael, you know, hit one and... See if there are any other thoughts that uh, we need to refine with that, if that makes sense or makes no sense or where it goes. And other than that, Ms. Jeannie, do we have um, Michael on the line? Or do we have a... and he, he is not on the line. Okay. And there's no cool. hands up. So. Well, I hope that uh, answered the question. 
And so let's go back to the uh, Gospel of Thomas that we were working on. And it's interesting how that question fits into the uh, the whole conversation that we were having yesterday. We finished off with saying 36, where Yeshua says, hey, get rid of anxiety. Anxiety is a product of mind. Anxiety is a, pro- a product of being stuck in carbon-based memory. You listen to people who have anxiety about following the rules of God, and what have they done? They violated the first law. Oh, should it be Saturday? Should it be Sunday? Should I be wearing this skirt? Should I be doing this? Should I be eating this food? Should I be doing that? Yeshua yeah, so here is saying, no, 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 that's not what it's about. Forgive as to your anxiety because anxiety is a killer of being. Be connected to the truth of who you are in your own temple. Make sure that the activity of your hands are in alignment with your higher purpose and life will feed you everything that you need. The next statement, statement 37, that comes out of the Gospel of Thomas And if you've just joined us, you haven't been with us, we've been working on this for a couple of days, and we'll be doing it for several more. We're looking at a text that, rather than being a story gospel, as, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are, this is a set of sayings that Yeshua presented, according to Thomas, and it really distills a lot of the wisdom, and it purports to be the inner secret teaching where... He spoke to the disciples and he said, I speak to them in parables because having eyes they do not see, having ears they do not hear. They don't have the brain cells. I'm I'm giving you the direct brain cells. And, and notice that there was, after three years full time with him, mass confusion. The guy who many want to make the head of his church, Peter, shortly before he goes off to the the final demonstration that he's going to have called crucifixion remember that they call it he called him satan i mean he literally called peter satan and and my take would be peter and none of the disciples got it none of the disciples understood what was really going on they had a level of understanding but it just didn't didn't gel uh, elsewise why just hours before you know as he's coming out of the Garden of Gethsemane, the guy who's going to head up the whole organization for the rest of eternity gets labeled by Yeshua as Satan. You've got to know there's a different idea here. There's a different layer of meaning than than what the world has given it. People come with carbon-based memory in the world mind and try to figure out and understand what's going on in the spiritual dimension. And that's kind of like uh, an ant watching, you know, the latest Star Wars movie and and then the ant turning around and explaining to you what Star Wars is all about. It's like, good luck. Your carbon-based memory, your body's mind will never be up to that task. And anyone who's coming from that mind, turn tail and run. Because that mind is only going to replicate what's in it. And so in statement 37, the disciples are there. They're like, you know, show us, show us, tell us, tell us. So so they say, on what day will thou be revealed to us? On what day shall we see you? And Yeshua has an interesting answer here. And basically, before I read his answer, the bottom line of the answer is, you're going to have to learn to forgive everything in you and come to a direct experience of who you are, who I am, and what life is. And so his answer, it's kind of challenging to them, certainly challenging to people in today's world, especially all of the aberrant insanity around sexuality in our culture. But he takes this into the realm of sexuality now. He says, 
You know, they're asking, when are you going to, when are you going to show, you know, when are you going to uncover all this? When are you going to reveal to us where we'll really see you? And he says, when you unclothe yourselves and are not ashamed. In other words, you got re- got to get rid of your fear-based shame. Remember that statement in the scripture, you know, with all this stuff about genitals, then the trauma and drama in the world around it. And there's one part in the scriptures where, where the creator says, who even told you you were naked? What is all this foolishness you're doing? So you have a penis, you have a vagina, so what? Who told you all this garbage about it? So what Yeshua is saying is, here in essence is, guys, you're going to have to get rid of your fear-based minds. So he says, when you unclothe yourselves and you are not ashamed, ah, you've healed your fear. When you take your garments off and lay them beneath your feet like little children and tread on them, then you shall see the Son of the Living One and you shall not fear. So what's he saying? For yourself of the mind of man. Remember, there are two minds spoken of in these ancient teachings. One is the mind of man, carbon-based memory. One is the mind of Christ, the mind of love. Now, if you think about the idea of the mind of Christ, the mind of love, what is it that goes against that mind in a human being? And what would you call that mind which goes against that mind of Christ? And when you really start breathing and looking at that, what is it in each and every human being that blocks them from being aware of who they are as human beings, as love, but what is stored in their own bodies, minds, or what was called the mind of man, the mind of Adamos, the red clay. And that mind has a number, you'll remember. You know, if if we had 100 people who observed a particular event, let's say we've got 100 test subjects and we're going to set up this event that's really terrible, something really nasty. And as these 100 people observe this event, one goes off raging and screaming, one goes off crying, one collapses and goes unconscious, one goes into terror, one gets his fists out and starts beating people up. Cause of what's going on were the event in anyone's life at any time, then we'd all be doing the same things in response to every event. But you'll notice we're not. We don't. Why not? Because each of us has a multi-generational database stored in this body-mind unit. And if you were to deliver your body-mind unit to a chemistry lab and say, hey, break this thing down and tell me what it's made of. Tell me what the primary component is of this structure. The chemistry lab would come back and say, your body is made of carbon. It's a carbon-based device. And if you look at the carbon-based atom, you will note that there are, in a carbon-based, in a natural carbon-based atom, there are six electrons, six protons, and six neutrons. Carbon is a storage system which holds all of the content generation to generation to generation to generation of we as human beings. You and I each have a carbon-based memory system. When an event happens, that event resonates information. We think we're looking through our eyes at the event out there. We're not looking through our eyes at the event at all. We're looking at the content of our mind projected into that event, whatever's stored in carbon-based memory. So one person looks at the event and runs off screaming in terror. Another person looks at the event and wants to fight. Another person is so overwhelmed they, they collapse and go unconscious. Why? Because each has a different multi-generational database in their carbon-based memory system. And it would appear that there wasn't much difference 
2,000 years ago than today when the metaphor that Yeshua uses to represent being free of fear and hostility, being free of your carbon-based memory, says, take your clothes off, guys. And when you can take your clothes off and be free of all shame, be free of everything based in fear. And try on them. It's like, then your higher faculty of true perception will be opened. Then your faculty of intuition will be opened and you will experience me directly rather than through your mind's reality structures, rather than through the mind of man, rather than through carbon-based memory. So, in essence, his answer to that question is, when are you going to know him directly? When you're free of everything that you've projected into your brain's image of him. When are you going to know yourself directly? When you're free of everything you projected into your brain's image of yourself. When are you going to know your partner directly? When you free yourself of everything you projected into your brain's image of them. When are you going to know the world directly? When you free yourself of everything that you projected into the world. And you remember the foundation of most lives today, once people get past the age of four, is you made me mad, you made me sad, you upset me, you hurt me, you destroyed me, you damaged me, it's all your fault. And that means that one dissociates from the very content of their minds that they need to heal in order to function as human beings. So there's a corollary in The Course in Miracles that says, come empty-handed to the Creator. Actually, I reinterpret that a little bit because we can come empty-handed and still have our heads filled with all kinds of garbage. Come empty-headed. Come free of everything that carbon-based memory wants to force you to believe that carbon-based memory replicates over and over and over again and a thousand themes and blames a thousand different people for them. You'll know the truth directly, the actuality, when you are freed of your realities. Then statement 38, Yeshua says, Many times have you desired to hear these words which I speak unto you, and you have none other from whom to hear them. Days will come when you will seek after me and you will not find me. My, my take on that is Yeshua saying, if you're in a state of understanding and wanting to do your work now, do it now while I'm here to guide you, is what he's saying here. He said, you've been wanting to hear this for how long, and now you're hearing it. And so many people hear it, and because the work can get heavy, what needs to be faced, what needs to be dealt with can be difficult, most people turn tail and run. And it takes years for them to come back and years for them to start to understand. And I'll say that, you know, after 50-plus years of doing this work, developing this work, I myself many times in the last five, ten years have felt like, oh, I'm finally beginning to understand. And you've heard me say it on the show more than once. You know, I wish we could get to a, a space where we have 100 hours a day because it would be so easy to fill 100 hours a day with the number of things there are to comprehend and understand about this work about this creation, about our human lives and what we're capable of. So he's saying, if you're hearing it from me, pick the tools up now and do your work because I may not be available to you tomorrow. So get off your duff and do your work now. And I will support you. And then... Well, we're at the halfway point of the show, so let's just open the gate and see if we've got anybody with a hand up. If there's anything happening in the chat room, sweetie, before we move into statement 39 from the Gospel of Thomas. There are no hands up. Bob's in the chat room. Uh, you can go back and listen to the beginning of our uh, second hour of the radio show. I read an email 
uh, where a lady was very thankful for what you shared on the show, and she said to to just express that to you. And a hand did go up while I was talking, and it's Miss Susan six one zero. You're on the air. And Jeannie, oh, boy, I, just before is... I talk to Susan, my my thought is that maybe go ahead and just forward that paragraph to Bob, so he's got it. That's a powerful acknowledgement. Again, thank you, Bob. Okay. Hey, Miss Susan, welcome. How are you, young lady? Oh, I'm I'm blown away. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, this reading you is mean you're amazing. getting naked? <laughs> it's too cold already. It's too cold. Oh, okay. But <laughs> um, this, what you're reading is, it's just, I can almost not find words, but it's, it fits so much with the experience I'm having for two reasons here is one is I've been making it, we've been doing big clean out here, trying to accommodate a new family, number one. Number two, right. getting ready to get rid of stuff so that our kids don't have to handle a lot of stuff. And we're not, we don't have scads of stuff. We've lived very sparsely, thank goodness. But even so, you know how it is. Things just collect. But one of the things that's collected for me over my lifetime is my journals, um, all it, letters. I've saved a lot of those things. And I don't want the kids to feel as if they have to go through all that before they burn it. So... I've I've been at this for months now. I'm not writing any music, really. I'm waiting to put on one production, but otherwise nothing new is coming out in the music department. But this, and it's shocking to me how I spent years and years and years wanting one thing, and it was set up in my psyche not to get that thing. And the, I have, you know, I did some Jungian therapy for several years, wrote down tons of dreams, and it's amazing how much you remember dreams when you start writing them down and paying attention. They'll show up and stay in your mind. But I'm finding those just not interesting. All it's showing me is how amazingly creative we all are and how much wheel spinning we're doing, because we need right. the tools. And you're talking right. about Jesus, Jesus saying, hop to folks, I'm here, I can teach you this stuff. Well, look what's happened. You have teachers popping up now all over the place who are teaching in their own way what Jesus was trying to teach, you being, for me, right. the one person that helped me understand how to get better, how to heal from stuff, how to notice what we're doing and 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 stop doing it. And I've got the tools, and so I know how to find my way into being well, and I feel as if I've, knock on wood, never been as well as I am now. Mm, but I'm nice. Not, I'm Yay. Not, yeah, it is nice, but I'm not well. I'm not over the... It seems Finish. as if that little nugget in there is just sitting in there going, nah, 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 I'm going <laughs> to I'm gonna keep bugging you. But I just can step away and watch it now. Yeah. And, and know that there's no solution there. There's no, that's not the right tree to be back barking up. So in a way, doing the tools has allowed Tim and me to become unfamiliar to ourselves. We don't know who we are. Suddenly we're these two old folks who are living on the second floor of a house that's being taken over by two teenage boys and his mother. And they right. are they they only moved in yesterday and so I can't make a report, but they're just lovely, sweetheart folks who have been through very hard things. And I feel as if we're just out here to be useful, to to function as a, somebody who can help 
somebody else be a little more comfortable for a while. And I don't, I, I, I don't even know what to do with that thought because that already gets into ego. Like, aren't we great that we're doing this? It isn't even that anymore. It's like this. Right. This ought to be happening right now because it's what came you. across our path, and 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 they, it's needed. And you've been doing it, and it just astounds me. Like you're talking about the Course in Miracles. Kim Hayes was talking about um, Alan Cohen's uh, A Course in Miracles Made Easy or A Course of Love or the butterfly books that he talks about, <laughs> iguanas and butterflies and things. All these, and the book, but it's amazing to have the book of Thomas come into focus as one of those things that was out there before any of this was out. Anyway, I'm just going on and on, but it's very Thousands exciting. Thousands of years ago. Yeah. And, and you know, it? I'm with you. Yeah. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> well, I'm just with you and marveling at it, and at the same time, you know, I've said this several times in the last few months to Jeannie. It's like, God, why can't we get 100 hours into a day? It's like there's so much to be understood. And especially since I've started to do this quantum still point with people, it's like a whole new world is opened and there aren't enough hours in a day. And I feel like after 50-some years of doing this work, like I'm just getting started. Like, uh, oh, wow. finally we're getting getting some traction, getting going here. You know, we, we had... One fellow came in and did that a, a, a couple of months ago, and he had been through uh, Jungian training, and he said, this mm-hmm. is the missing piece of Jung's work. And, you know, it's like this whole, when, when we get past nine-bit mind and realize, what, is there 20, maybe 100 trillion bits of data, you know, to think about numbers in the actual world, and, and what is it? that needs to happen for us, you know, in order to do this thing <clears throat> that this last statement of Yeshua says, like, take off your clothes and be free, you know, like, mm-hmm. to get free of all of that, to open the gate to what, what's it really all about, Elfie? It's, it's monumental. And it's, like, totally disappearing. Like, who, you don't know who you are anymore, and you don't even care yeah. that you don't know who you are yeah. anymore. Because you're in the experience of who you are. Being. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, being. It's, it, you're in the experience. You don't have to know because it's only the mind that wants to figure it out. Remember, that's the number one pseudo solution of the non-being mind. If I could just figure this out, see if I could figure out who I am, rather than oh, function as a being and yeah, all that stuff is like meaningless, you know, fluff. You know, it's funny. This is spreading into all kinds of realms. Being Being 80 years old, and I watched my incredibly lively, bright mother. I I know I I talked about our beginnings, and those were rough, because she needed information, and she needed help, and so forth. Right. But later, later on, we became good friends, and she, she was incredibly interested in staying. She didn't want to be an old lady in the sense that she never, she never acted like an old woman. She was right. like a young girl for her whole life. And one thing she did which fascinated me is she had this boudoir with perfumes and creams and she always had her hair dyed. Uh, she only went gray when she was like 75, but then it wasn't gray anymore. It could have been, but she, it was red and I thought it was terrible. It was looked fake, but anyway, she wanted to stay. But she liked it. She liked it, and she wanted to stay a young girl. And she'd wear these. She had a cute little body, and she would wear these little baby girl negligees and parade around the house. And <laughs> even though she was old and sort of rumpled up, and she was on hormones. And back then, I don't know how how common that was, but they did her in good stead, I guess, because she was right. well until she, until she croaked. But um, I was having a, I'm going off on a tangent, but I was having a discussion with a nutritionist doctor, a friend of mine, who uses bioidentical hormones, and I'm, 
I'm on those two and have been for three years for right. various sleep, sleeplessness, you know, unnecessary this is and that. And she wants me to go for a, a fancy mammogram. I have to drive an hour away to get it. And it's a special kind that will do a better reading. And I'm saying to her, you know, I feel as if I'm coming to myself from both ends. I want to live forever, and I don't want to live forever. I don't want to live to the point where I'm the responsibility of my children and I'm using up their resources. If I could live and be vital, that might be another thing, but all the pictures I've seen of old people past 100 look pretty bad. Uh, They don't move very well and they're all crinkled up and I don't, why would I drive an hour away to find out if my bosoms are okay when I'm arguing with myself that I'm going to have to die, and I think if that were the way I'd go, I'd be okay with that, I think. I don't know, Michael. Anyway, there's just so much to think about and not understand. There's the non-being mind again, you know. So I just said, I'll write you a letter. I'll say, you are not responsible if I find out that the hormones were hurting me in that way. My doctor here is not responsible and you're off the hook. Nobody's going to sue you. No family member, and I certainly won't because I'd be dead by then. Am I making any sense at all? She just got to laughing. She said, I, I hear the discussion, and, you know, there's the argument and, and one of the challenges between being and non-being. Yeah. And, you know, to me the objective is, to more and more stand in that state of being and uh, say to your mind, you know, just shut up already. Dad, let me just live. Let me just, you know, do I have to worry about eternal life or death? Or this? Well, you know, yeah. I'll pay attention to what I need to pay attention to and I'll do the best I can do and, and move forward and whatever occurs, occurs. Yeah. But getting lost in the uh, the generational patterns of, not knowing and therefore being addicted to wanting to know when it can't be known. It can yeah. only be experienced. You know, it's like right. the, it's like the life is of a different realm than knowing. But our world has taught us, oh, you got to know that's where it's at. It's like, yeah, no, there's certain well, things Michael, that need to be understood. But I wanted to have you back up because you said the still point work, which you know I don't do. Uh, uh, either it's resistance or it's an anatomical thing and, and I just drown in saliva and, and concentrate on my mouth staying open. I need a little prop or something like a pencil to hold it open. I gave I've up I've done on that before that. with people. Have you? <laughs> have I you have. Really? Yep, that's yeah. a very, uh, I've done that many times in intensive and have some clean new pencils and I'll just insert the pencil and, and then the teeth can't close and the breath can stay open. But mm-hmm. but actually what I was okay. talking about was the quantum still point because a whole new thing is opened up beyond okay. just the still point process. Well, you've probably said what that is. Is it okay to ask again or do you want to read more and I won't, I'll, I'll get it from you another time. What would be good? No, it's fine. It's fine. I've actually been working on it for months on a definition of it, working to understand what's happening with it and put it into words so that it makes some sense to people. But mm-hmm. it's a, a three-day, three to five-day personal intensive where we're working with people on still point, on paying attention to Satan, Remembering that in Aramaic, Satan means yeah. the resistor. So paying yeah. attention to where the resistance is in physiology, where the energy is being held, and learning to soften, let that go, so that physiology can turn into a superconductor state. You know, if you look at the average person, they're in tension all the time. You know, tension, headaches, the body's just all locked up, and all of that is dissociation all of that is an attempt to stop the movement of energy through the system so part of the quantum still point is working with people to reinterpret their resistance to the flow of energy through themselves their interpretation as the flow of energy through themselves as pain to experience the energy movement in the body as sensation and to in letting go of the resistance 
stepping into a superconductor state, and then in that superconductor state, realigning the core of the antenna, and it's it's like a quantum leap from still point breathing. It's just a quantum experience that I still don't understand myself. I'm actually but working on are... training someone. I'm working on training someone to do it so that I've got somebody to do it on me. Oh, boy. I've got, you know, you've heard me speak about Patrick. He's actually coming up in November. We've got a week set aside to work together. I've been talking to him about it, and, you know, I did some work on him when I was in Florida. I did it with him. Right. And he's like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, I've worked for 50 years, and I got more changes in two hours than 50 years. What's going on here? It's like, okay, so, wow. Patrick, I'll take you through more of it, but, you know, come and, and uh, we'll train you in it, and then, and then uh, you can do it on me, and I'll do more work on you with it. So I still don't know what's happening. I don't know how to explain it. I just know that it creates a transformation beyond anything and everything that I've ever done with people. Wow. You know, I don't know if you were on the show. When I was working with Peter from Sweden, we went up to mm -hmm. Ohio and spent time with him. Yeah. But if you remember, he got on the show, and you know he's from a – a nation that is not oriented toward Christianity in any way, shape, or form. In fact, it's relatively pagan. And uh, yeah. he came out of the third day session. We actually did a five-day, and he came out of the third day session. And I, he shared this on the show, so I'm not telling any stories out of school. And he said, oh, this isn't about being a Christian. This is about bringing in Christ. He oh, got, I mean, he just had the direct experience. Here it is. Look, oh, my God, look at this. You know? Yeah. And uh, and and there's not much more you can do in terms of putting it into words, but that's the, that's the still point, quantum still point. So I'm getting really into the brain and into my non-being mind when I ask, could this be done? Could those antenna be opened without breathing through your mouth? <laughs> Well, you'll remember that part of the challenge is, well, let me approach it from a different place, from something you said a couple of minutes ago. All that's just your resistance, that's all, and it can be overcome. When you breathe through the mouth in the still point process, you're mm -hmm. not feeding the brain yeah, its full supply of oxygen. And yeah. that's one of the reasons for doing still point through the mouth is that it's not forcing air up through the sinus passages and delivering oxygen to the brain that keeps the brain go, 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 go. We want that thing to shut up. We want it to get quiet to step into that experience of being. But, uh, but all, you know, the excess saliva or the dry mouth that some people get, all of that's just part of the resistance process, and uh, we'll work through that. We'll overcome it. And... Uh I do have, I can feel the resistance. I can also feel that I might die because I can't get whatever I think I need if I'm not breathing through my nose, um, you know, for periods of time. Okay. It's another, but, another worksheet. Another yeah. worksheet. Yeah. I keep wanting to say, I bet you I can get there without doing this. I can find mm -hmm. my way there. Hey, go I for it. it. Works for me. Works <laughs> for me. Does? Get there, you know. <laughs> yeah, go for it, for sure. Oh, I was afraid you were going to say, no, you can't get there except this. No, place. no, 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 no. You can't get there Good. from here? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> well, and you know what? In I terms of technology, else. in yes. terms of technology for... Um, Making the process more sure and mm -hmm. shortening the time of it. Mm -hmm. These are the best tools I've been able to come up with. Gotcha. Uh, you just flipped the switch, though, Michael. Thanks. When you you said you can get there without doing this or go for oh, it. Oh, absolutely. You're designed to live it. It's your most natural state. I mean, all all we're doing with the work is overcoming something totally fake, false, and artificial. It, the the mm -hmm. simple thing is, if if we could just hear and do it, go back to our natural state, it would be done. That simple. 
That's all it is. It's get like mm. like that passage that I just read. What did he say? They want to see him. They want to know you know everything that that he is because he's got so much to, to give them. What does he say? Okay, yeah. get naked and be free of fear, and uh, and you got it. That's all. Oh boy. Yeah. But what are we going to have to face to do that? You know, and uh, but but the, the simple bottom line is everything that that has to be forgiven is just that which is artificial. And your most natural uh, state is yeah. to live in being. Mm-hmm. And that shows how deep the brainwash of the world is. Yeah. You know, you even look at when we were in school, what did they do? They taught us a thing called spelling. I mean, mm-hmm. look at the word spell. Were we being put oh. under a spell by words? Mm. Oh, I never thought of that. That's interesting. And and to get out of that spell, that, that's the bottom line of the work is to be free of the spells and function as human beings. We're not, we're, this, this instrument, my take is this body-mind instrument is no part of who we actually are. It's just a vehicle of expression. And we've confused mm-hmm. the perceptual constructs in the vehicle of, of expression for who we are. And that's where Yeshua mm. says, in order for you being to live, you've got to die. The false self has got to be removed, has got yeah. to go. And it's the most natural thing in the world, but it's been so deeply embedded over the generations that it seems, you know, kind of impossible. Yeah. Still breathing with you. Yeah, it's a convergence of so many things. Peter's... Yes realization that it's the Christ and who is the Christ. The Christ is the universal Christ available to all in all cultures at all times forever since the beginning of or before the beginning of time. And yet what you flip the switch is I was a member of a Christian cult when I was 16. My first love affair was with a woman who was four years older than I and told me they had the truth and we were lovers for a very short time she loved me for being the free spirit that I was I was totally unchurched and I was dancing and drawing and playing the piano and all this stuff and she fell in love with me I thought she was the weirdest creature but being set up the way I was anybody who fell in love with me I was going to fall in love with <laughs> oh, them if you, got it, if you got attention that was ah, that was it eh? so I I became crazy about her, and she wanted me to come to her church, which was far away, near the college I went to. And I've probably told this before. I went to that college in order to be able to go to her church on Sundays. College would have never yeah. let me in if they knew that was my main reason for applying there. But right. as soon as I got there, she tried to make me into the kind of person who was acceptable in that church, which was, you don't cut your hair. You don't bite your fingernails. You don't speak out of turn. You wear long underwear from November to November. And you become a person that she couldn't love. And as soon as she couldn't, I had to leave. And Mm. they were telling me they had the truth, the only way. You have to keep your mouth open or you won't get it. I mean, that's what I translated your still point breathing into is you, you can't uh, do this. Or you uh, okay. I, I got it. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Everybody's got a reality, right? Yeah. So, yeah. oh, my God. What a life. Anyway, thanks. <laughs> That's a lot of fun. Wondrous opportunities to learn forgiveness. Mm. And in the metaphorical sense, in the sense of being free of what's in carbon-based memory, becoming naked, you know, yeah. freeing ourselves of of all of that, all of, of those capacities to form perception. Mm. So it's quite a task. Yeah. Oh, the original okay. incredible joiny. Well, you know, Michael, I, I, I wish you luck teaching it to Patrick so that he can do you. <laughs> that shows yes, a lot of faith on your part. That's, that's my can, dream. 
Well, I can just see you popping out of it saying, no, no, that's not the right way to do it. You have to do it <laughs> this way, and you can't get into your stuff <laughs> because you have to keep teaching them. Good luck with that. I mean, whoa. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's exciting. Well, I've, yeah. I've, uh, as I've started to do it, you know, when I was in, in med school, anatomy and physiology were not my strong suit. They weren't my interest. Mine was always my interest. But now mm -hmm. I'm back to, I've actually been buying craniums and brains and <laughs> and to work to understand how this whole antenna works and such. So it's, as I say, if I had 100 hours in a day, I would be absolutely delighted at this thing where, you know, you have to stop and eat and you have to go do this and you have to do that. Well, you have to take your Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> well, it becomes a Sabbath, though. That's what the whole idea of the Sabbath is, taking care of yourself, being in the state of being. Mm. Oh. Doing the work of Yeshua. Becoming naked of all forms of hostility, fear, rage, guilt, grief, drama, and trauma. And when you look at how impacted we were as infants, as children, how impacted our parents and their parents and their parents were, how right. engaged in the stuff of the world. You know, and, you know, one day out of seven, that prescription said, as the question Michael was asking was, take that percentage of your time and dedicate that to your process. You know, when you've been reading your book, that you, I know we're coming toward the end, but you've been reading your book, and Tim, Dr. Tim has introduced us to a young man named Mark Habis, who has found himself writing a book that he thought he'd get into trouble with his friends with because it, it was like channeling. He was hearing Jesus' voice. And when you've been reading your book, I felt as if you were doing the same thing, this latest book particularly. But most of it, everything, when you look at it from a certain angle, it's a kind of channel, channeling. And, um, you, you, and maybe this breathing technique is part of that, to open up ways of listening, hearing. We'll, we'll see. Yeah. And if you go back, you know, back probably, I don't know, a year or more ago, we did a uh, a, a couple of days on the Beatitudes, if you remember. Yep. And Mark is someone that had been in one of our intenses back, oh, 10 or 12 oh, really? years ago. And wow. uh, and he's he's the one who did that discussion with me. He'd, he'd really been touched by the Beatitudes when he came to the intensive and had been working oh. with them. So that's why I had asked him to come and, and be part of it. But, yeah, he's... I didn't realize that. So well, that makes yeah. sense. It's almost as if by using the tools, you open the channels, you get out of your own way, and then you're getting it. You're getting live stream. <laughs> it's where we're all designed to live. Oh. No gurus. Remember, remember that passage where the creator's talking to humans and saying, you know, and there's going to come a point where you're going to realize it's all written in your heart. One person isn't going to yeah. teach another. It's just going to be, yeah. it'll be critical mass. Every human being on the planet will have access to it because every human being is designed to have access to it directly from the beginning, yeah. from day one. And the specialty of the world is knocking it out of us. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we, we come in. That's why we ask that question so often of, ever held a newborn child? We come yeah. into the world as that presence of love. And then the world knocks it out of us and then sends us out with this false definition. It says, go find somebody to love or somebody to love you. And now the mind yeah. is so far from what it's designed to be that escaping from it has become a major piece of work. Okay. Well, it's 2 o'clock. Thank you, Michael and Jeannie. All right, dear heart. You have a blessed one. Lots of love. Thanks. You too. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.